Hello and welcome back to the channel. I'm Buddy Lindsay and today I want to talk to you about a Cub tractor and whether it might be a right fit for your homestead or not. Plus a couple of things about getting started with them that I wish I had known before I got mine. Uh, today we're going to talk about this tractor and another one I'll show you here in a minute. First, let's hit a little bit of history on it. These uh, tractors started being manufactured in 1947 and ran all the way through about 1979 and eventually became what was the Cub Cadet Company when International Harvester sold off the franchise. Because they were in production for so long, about 250,000 of them were produced and so there are plenty of them out there and lots of parts still available. One of the interesting things about International Harvester and Cubs is that a lot of their tractors start out at 501 for the very first tractor off the line. And on Cubs, you can see it with this little plate up here on the right side of the tractor up front. And in this case, mine is in the 4000s. So it was actually in the first year of production. So that makes this a 1947 model. Unfortunately, with this Cub, it does not have a plate on it. And so I'm not 100% sure of the year. One thing I could look at is the uh, number on the side of the engine block, and I can start getting a narrowed down uh idea of what that is however with these two holes here uh, i can definitely say it is a pre early 1950s to a late 1940s the other thing that kind of gives it away is the uh, hydraulic system which i'll get to here in a little bit and the fact that it has a generator on here so it should have been a six volt so that means it is probably a late 1940s or very early 1950s one of the interesting things is in the letter series and in the cubs especially the smaller letter series international harvesters is they had the cultivation set up and you can see that because the body is offset to the main thing and you have your seat back there so that you can see down and see what you're doing and specifically when you're cultivating your field Fields, you can see what's going on and you're not kind of bobbing and weaving back and forth trying to see what's going on and so that is one way you can start to tell if it's a cub or not and again that started early on later on in versions of from the, you get to the cub cadet uh, era this actually gets shifted back over to the center and it is no longer the cultivation type but this stayed like this I think for the entire run of the uh, the international cub uh, in this case, it's a Farmall Cub, eventually becomes the International Cub. So it's basically a little bit of the history on the Cub. I could go in a lot more detail, but I'm going to cut it off there. The next thing I want to do, we're going to get into more of like, what are the things that I wish I knew before I got one or when I got one so that I could better understand what's going on. And that is to actually start the thing. Uh, this one does not run. I am working on getting it to run, but I do know the process and I understand why. Uh, understanding why and how it starts actually made things a lot more simpler. Uh, the first thing is you have this lever and you pull it back to pull the choke. The next thing is you can pull this out to tell the electrical system, hey, I want to actually start. And then you pull this lever to actually hit the starter that's actually connected to the motor. Once it actually starts up, you push this lever back in to let off the choke and you're ready to go. I just put it in gear. Uh, I guess. One thing that is important to note is you shouldn't have it in gear when you actually start it up, especially because this thing has a, a crank start and if it's in gear and you crank start it, it's going to jump in and run you over and that's no fun for anybody's day. So with that, like starting is fairly simple. Pull to start, pull the choke, pull to start, set off the choke and you're ready to go. So let's get into some of the specifics about the Farmall Cub. I'm going to keep it brief and kind of hit on a bunch of little things and not go into too much detail. Uh, the engine is a C60 uh, engine. It is a four cylinder engine and is used the same block for the entirety of the run of uh, Farmall Cubs and then later International Cubs. So this block is readily available. Uh, this being in 1947, it started out at nine, uh, I think it was 9.25 horsepower and eventually got all the way up to 18 horsepower by the end of the run. This is a gasoline engine and you have your tank here. And the interesting thing is the tank is connected to the actual hood. Uh, so when you pull the hood off, you have to take the tank with it too. So as you might've noticed, this is the front of the tractor and on the front generally is the radiator for the cooling system. Uh, interesting note is the front, this grill type right here is generally what was made from about 1947 um, up into the mid 1950s. Then it went into a more slotted uh, grill, um, similar to what you might see on letter series uh, farm all tractors. Uh, and then and they had various types of that. Then they went into kind of a flat nose um, cub and in the 60s and into the 70s. And that's kind of a general idea how you can see what is what. Um, also, this is more roundy. 
uh, I know it's a trademark term, uh, and then later on they get a little more square-y. Uh, so keep that in mind on kind of kind of what generation you're in. This again, this is a 1947. It's the first year production, and uh, actually I'm glad the year that I want is a 1955 because it has the specific grill that I want. Uh, what I might end up doing is buying that grill and throwing it on this one. So let's talk about electric and uh, getting this thing to run. Here is the starter. And uh, I talked to earlier, there's normally a lever here and it pushes on this button to actually do the start of the system and it runs off of the battery. Here is the magneto instead of a uh, electric start. It has a magneto that turns and creates electricity to create the spark to run through the spark plugs into the actual engine itself. Uh, and then up here is an alternator. Now this is different from uh, most of your uh, early model uh, Cubs because they would normally have a generator here and the system would be a six volt system. This one was upgraded from a six volt to a 12 volt. Around the middle of the 1950s is when they converted over to 12 volt because that's where the industry standard was going. Um, I, could down, I could back this down to a six volt system and be just fine. I don't know what I wanna do yet, but for now, 12 volt is gonna have to do. Um, I might need to rebuild this generator, but this is an international, I think this is the, uh, yep, there's a little logo right there. This is an International Harvester J4 Magneto. Uh, different from the H4 Magneto, this, this Magneto was created specifically for the Cub. I forgot to hit on it, but one of the reasons that I know it was converted over to 12 volt is because A, it takes a 12 volt battery, and B, because the alternator was it should have been a generator for the six volt system uh, in the case of this Cub. Let's go ahead and talk about the last couple of things. This is the transmission all in this area doing gears it has a three a speed transmission going forward one speed going backwards this here controls the pto shaft which lives right here uh, this is a vertical 90 degree pto converter to go down to a uh, mowing uh, mower deck system but the pto shaft comes out here one of the things to note about the pto shaft is normally they have a standardized uh, amount that they spend on more modern tractors. In this case, this spins as fast as the engine does. And so this thing can spin up to 18 to 2000 RPMs. And so that is something to note, you can't put a standard PTO driven element on the back of this. So I wanna put out two final things on the back here. We have the draw bar here. Uh, which has this custom adapter for the mower, but generally it's this part that is the drawbar. And then back here we have the final drive. The final drive basically takes energy and converts it to uh, spinning force for the tires. It took me a long time to understand what that is and I wanted to mention it. In this case, this is all dirty and yuck and everything else and I do need to clean it up. So the last thing I wanna talk about is this hole right here. In this case, I have a hole. And in this case, I don't have a hole. Uh, this is the hydraulic system. This is where everything lives for doing your hydraulics. It comes to the front and it gets uh, your hydraulic drive off of the engine, uh, but this is where it lives. And this actually didn't come as a, an option in the first two years of production and was generally something people added uh, to further on. And you can retrofit because they have the holes in there to be able to add hydraulics to uh, the 47s and 48s. I got this one specifically so I can grab the hydraulics off of it and a few other pieces uh, so I can put it on the other tractor. Uh, but the hydraulic system is actually called the touch control system and is actually run by this lever right here and allows you to raise and lower your different uh, components that you wanna do. So in the case of the mower, I would be able to raise and lower it. In case of cultivator, you know, front plow, uh, back plow, all kinds of different things. Uh, the hydraulics is an important system, um, but you know, running brand new, if I were to get a rebuilt one, it would probably cost five to $600 for everything. And I paid a little less for this tractor, which isn't in great shape, but has a hydraulic system in it. So the Cubs do come with a carburetor. In the case of the early models, they have an IH, um, an International Harvester built carburetor. In later models, they had a Zenith carburetor that they used. Uh, normally there is a fuel bowl that it comes out to. In this case, uh, the person I bought it off just did direct into a fuel filter. Um, a lot of people um, will use the bowl, come out of the pipe into a fuel filter and then into the carburetor. Um, then it goes up into the exhaust manifold and then out the top into a top stack. Later versions of the Cub do not have a vertical uh, um, exhaust. They actually come down and out the back end uh, for a lower um, 
exhaust. And then finally, you just have your oil dipstick here and uh, so that you can uh, check the oil level in your engine. So really that is it on the various components of the International Cub. I guess the final thing is you can do a hand crank there, but you do uh, generally need a magneto in here to be able to do a hand crank on it. Um, it is something I don't have yet, but something I am going to get and be able to do because I just kind of like the idea of doing a hand crank start. So with that in mind, why would you want to see about getting a cub for your homestead? Well, for one, it's the price. I mean, the price they can be had very cheap. Uh, between the two of these, I paid uh, a little under uh, $1,500, and I'm probably only going to put a few hundred dollars into it to get this thing actually running, and it can be a workhorse. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of reasons, but uh, basically International Harvester, and definitely in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, were overbuilt and will last a long time. Uh, I just, I like the look of this. I like that it is, it is overbuilt and will last for a very long time. Uh, and because there were so many made, there are lots of parts still to be able to uh, fix this up and keep it maintained. Along with parts availability, um, this is a simple machine. It is early uh, mechanics of everything, but there's, there's not a lot of extra power and electronics to it. I mean, it's an engine, it's a carburetor, it's a gas tank, it turns gears and you go. I mean, it, it is kind of the simplicity of uh, the systems of building a, a tractor and it can last a lot longer. Uh, the power isn't uh, there, um, for doing really big things but if you keep it under control with what you can do it'll do a lot for you on a homestead and can be cheaper uh, than the standardized golf cart that a lot of people go with um, this is a again it's a great machine and it will last a long time now let's talk about why you might not want this i mean let's be honest this thing is nearly is 70 years old nearly um, it's going to require work <clears throat> it's going to require maintenance. It's going to require fixing. Um, I bought it specifically because it's going to require that so that I can get some mechanical chops and not on a complicated system so that I can carry that over into another tractor I'm working on that has more power. That's another reason. This does not have a lot of power. It will do a lot for you. Some of the stuff I've seen people do with it on YouTube is quite amazing, frankly. And for just generally moving stuff around um, without a loader, um, <clears throat> you can drag quite a bit of stuff uh, and if you build your um, homestead around using something like this to pull things around to push things into place uh, you can get a lot of use out of this thing but let's be honest it's old it's going to require work and it's not going to probably do everything you want you want to look at this as a supplementary vehicle uh, especially if you want something with a loader to be able to do a bunch of stuff. This does not have a loader. They do make a load. They did make a loader for it, but as I've seen people describe on the internet, you pretty much don't want to do anything more than what you would do in a wheelbarrow in it. So those are a couple of the reasons you might not want to actually get one, and I would suggest you actually think through what you want. For me, I like the idea of learning how to work on engines. I like the idea of having something a little extra around the house to do specific tasks. Uh, I want this to learn on, I want this to teach my children on, and I need a backup mower because I don't know how much longer my mower is going to last. And then finally, I want something that's going to last a long time. I look at this and I want to fix it up, restore it, and I want to be able to use it whenever I'm 70, 80 years old and have my children and grandchildren be like, this is grandpa's. And I want it to be able to say, hey, this is over 100 years old and it's still providing a service to a homestead doing exactly what it was designed to do. So definitely keep an eye out on the channel. I am going to be working on this and the other one and getting things going. It's going to be a continual series uh, over the next probably a couple of years on the channel of me doing stuff. I want to be able to document everything that I do on it to provide uh, extra content for others that want to go down this journey as well. So with all that, stay tuned to the channel because I am going to be working on this cub. I am going to eventually, I want to see about restoring this. Uh, but for the most part, for the next couple of years, uh, the main goal is to get this thing running, clean it up, fix it up and use it as a bit of a workhorse around the homestead and to bring you along the journey on getting it running and keeping it going. This does not currently run and that is the first job to get this running and I want to show you what to do. If you found anything in this video interesting, please give a thumbs up and a subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it and I will see you next time where we hopefully start ripping into this thing and doing something to it uh, because the first thing I have to do is rebuild the carburetor and work on the magneto and the distributor cap a little bit and try to get this puppy running. It should run, but we'll see what it takes.